Thank you, choir, for that great message and song, a great reminder to trust in the Lord with all of our heart from Proverbs chapter 3. Thank you so much for that. Well, we are in week two of our sermon series that we began last week called The Last Book. And in the series, we are studying through the book of Revelation. And last week, we, we talked about how Revelation's kind of a, a very strange book. It's a weird book, but it's still the Word of God, and we study what the Word of God means for us and our lives today. Today, I'm excited to talk to you about the purposes of God. And I invite you to hear these words from Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne... A scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they began to sing a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered. And by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom. And priests serving our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth. And under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb. Be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And may God add his blessing to the reading of his word today. Well, as most of you guys know... Uh, Right across the street behind me, we have a lovely parsonage home for the preacher to live in. This lovely two-story house that has enough rooms in there for me to sleep in a different room every single night, if I choose to. And uh, when I moved in, uh, another thing I found out is that the parsonage has a true basement. Like a a go down the stairs into the dark basement. I've never had a basement before. I'm not going to lie. I'm a little scared of the basement over there. I don't don't spend a lot of time down there in the basement. I'm not that brave. Uh, I remember right after I moved into the house, a friend of mine came over. And one of the first things he saw was the basement. And he said, oh, cool, we got to go down there and check it out and see what's going on. Uh, Of course, you go down into the basement. There's not a lot there. It's unfinished. There's not a lot of uh, exciting stuff to to go down there for. And uh, I remember one day my brother came to visit me, and he brought my nephews with him. And they were younger at the time, so we didn't really want them running down the stairs into the basement, getting hurt, playing around down there where we couldn't see them. So as they were exploring the house, I decided that I was going to stand guard in front of the basement door. Not my best idea, because they immediately zeroed in as to what's behind that door there. I said, door? What door? They're like, that door behind you. I said, I don't see a door. They're like, yeah, that one, I can see it. They're like, no, it's a fake door. It doesn't go anywhere at all. They didn't, they didn't buy that. <laughs> they didn't believe it. But truth be told, uh, you know, if they would have gone down there, it was a room they couldn't go into. They didn't like that very much. But if they could have gone down there, they would have seen there's not that much to explore. It's not that exciting down there behind the locked door. Well, I thought about that as we're studying the book of Revelation 
Revelation 4 and 5, John is having a, a vision of the heavenly throne room with God and the angels present. And what John sees in the right hand of God is a scroll. This scroll is, is sealed shut. It is locked. And obviously the contents of this scroll are important. Unlike my locked door to the basement that doesn't really have anything down there, there's nothing really exciting to see, this scroll is important enough that all the attention of heaven is centered on it. Now, we're not told exactly what the scroll is, but we do know that it's sealed up, it's locked up tight. And judging by what comes later on in the book of Revelation, it seems most likely that the scroll unveils the future purposes of God. The future purposes of God to judge the world, to save the world, to renew creation, and to defeat evil forever. If you read through Revelation, that's exactly how the rest of it is going to go. The purposes of God are, are locked behind this scroll. And the question that's on everybody's mind in heaven is, who is worthy to open the scroll? It quickly dawns on the crowd that no one is worthy to open the scroll. It says no one in heaven or on earth could open it. Think about the angels. Angels are, angels are mighty. Angels are powerful. Even the angels couldn't open the scroll. Think about world leaders. All the world leaders, nobody found worthy to open the scroll. And John's response to all of that is to cry. He begins to weep because no one is found worthy. And I think he's thinking that that, that, that means nobody can accomplish God's purposes. I guess sin and evil are just going to win the day. But then... There's a twist. The twist is that there is one who can open the scroll, who can know its contents, who can put into motion God's plan of redemption. And we should not be surprised to find out that it is Jesus Christ himself. So the first thing that jumps out to me is that Jesus doesn't look like what we thought the Messiah was going to look like. After nobody is found worthy to open the scroll, John is weeping. And one of the elders says to him, he says, stop crying, don't worry about it. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered and he is worthy. The lion was a good image of what the Messiah was supposed to look like. He was going to be this, this conquering hero who was going to overthrow all evil, mighty, powerful, fierce. Do whatever it took to win the day. Now, imagine John's surprise when he heard about the Lion of Judah, but then what he saw was the Lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. John hears about a lion, but then he sees the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. The references to the Lion of Judah in Revelation are one time. The references to the Lamb are over 20 times. And this shows us who Jesus really is. Jesus is the lamb that was slain. It's a perfect picture of Jesus and, and, and what he came to do for us. Jesus turns all of our expectations upside down. He's not the Messiah who came to conquer by force and power and might. No, he's the one who came to be killed, to be sacrificed for our sake and for the world. I remember earlier this year I was watching a TV show on Disney+. Plus called The Book of Boba Fett. I don't know if you have any Star Wars fans in the house, but I'm a Star Wars fan, and Boba Fett was one of my favorite characters when I was growing up, so I couldn't believe they made a TV show about him. He was so cool. Uh, Boba Fett was this bounty hunter. He was a former bounty hunter, and he's tired of working for other people. He's tired of having bosses over him, and so he decides that he wants to be in charge. So one day he goes back to one of his old palaces and, and he executes the person who was in charge there so that he can now take the throne. And after he does his dirty work, he commandingly takes his seat on the throne of power. I thought about that. You know, that's how the world works, isn't it? Be more powerful than your opponent. Have more firepower than your opponent. Take out your opponent and then you can be in charge. But it's funny that that's not how Jesus chose to operate in this world. Instead of coming into the world to, to take up arms against the opponent and freeing his people, Jesus instead lets the world do its worst to him. He allows himself to be crucified, to be slain. And this was no mistake on the way to the throne. 
this was the way to his victory. Through the cross, Jesus is victorious over sin. And through the resurrection, Jesus is victorious over the grave. I want you to think back to your Old Testament. Uh, Think back to when the Jewish people had to put the blood of the lamb over their doors during the Exodus story so that they would be saved from the plagues in Egypt. But Jesus is the lamb of God whose blood was spilled and poured out over us so that we might be saved from our sins. I want to say a word about the metaphorical imagery we find here in Revelation. We need to remember that we are reading John's description of something that cannot be described. And so we don't need to dig so deeply into every single image and metaphor that we get lost in the weeds. For instance, we don't believe that Jesus was a literal lamb, right? We believe that Jesus was a human being. And we don't believe that Jesus had seven horns and seven eyes. I don't think that would get Jesus a big following while he was here on this earth. I think everybody would be creeped out if that's what Jesus really looked like. No, in Ancient writings, horns refer to power. So the lamb has perfect power. Seven eyes refers to perfect knowledge. So the Messiah, Jesus, has perfect power and he has perfect knowledge. And we don't need to be scared of this picture of Jesus. Jesus is like the lamb led to the slaughter. He's the one who was sacrificed for us and for our salvation. And he alone is the one to accomplish the purposes of of God. The second thing I want us to look at is what Jesus came to do for us. Has Jesus come to to wipe us off the face of the earth for being such bad sinners? Has Jesus come to say that, that God doesn't care about us and that we should quit dreaming and quit barking up the wrong tree? No. Verses 9 and 10, the congregation is singing to Jesus, you are worthy For you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God. Saints from every tribe, language, people, and nation. Because we are sinners, Jesus has come to rescue us from our sin. That's that's the ransom part that the scripture is talking about. He has come to, to win us back for God. And Jesus came to bring back people of every tribe, language, and nation. This reminds me that this is one of the many parts of Scripture that breaks down the dividing walls that we like to put up with one another. We know sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, one skin color is is more important than the other skin color. No, the Bible never says that. Uh, One nation is better than the other nation. No, it doesn't say that. Uh, Men are better than women or, or vice versa, women better than men. No, the Bible doesn't say that. What scripture says, this is very poetic language here in Revelation that says Jesus came for us all. He wants everyone. I got to ask you today, is there any part of you that wants to exclude other people from God's kingdom? Maybe we don't do it willingly or, or, or outright, but maybe we don't share the good news with certain people. Maybe we don't invite certain people to come to church with us. Maybe we like to look down our noses at certain people because they're not like us. Well, I'm really glad that Jesus didn't operate that way. He came into the world to make a way for people from every language, every nation, every tribe, every people. He came for everybody. Bob Tuttle was a uh, professor and a pastor at uh, Asbury Seminary. One day he was talking to a man who was a self-avowed atheist. And the man asked Bob why he was a minister. And Bob replied, he said, well, let me ask you a question. He said, if you could know for certain that there really is a God who loves you and who cares for you and who gives you his power to sustain you in life, would you be interested in a God like that? The man said, yes, I would. And so looking at the man rather intently, Bob said, that's why I'm a preacher. That's why I'm a minister, because I want to help people just like you know for certain that there is a God who loves you, that there is a God who cares for you, that there is a God who gives you his power to sustain you in life. Again, would you be interested in a God like that? The man said, yes. Yes, I would. 
And after that, the door was open for Bob to share Jesus with this individual, this, this atheist. Y'all, that's what we're supposed to live for, isn't it? To make the good news known to everybody. We want everybody to know that there is a God who loves us and who cares for us and who gives us his power to sustain us in life. We don't get to leave anybody out of that equation. Because Jesus didn't leave anybody out. He has come to make us into a kingdom that reflects his love and concern and care to the world. And we get to be priests in that kingdom. Priests to share love and share hope. We share blessing to everyone. Every tribe, every nation, every language, every people. Last thing that jumps out to me is that the only true response to Jesus in his work is to worship him. After Jesus comes forward in heaven to take the scroll and to open the seals to accomplish God's purposes, the congregation burst out into singing. And verse 14 says that they fell down and worshipped, worshipping the Father, worshipping the Son, Jesus, for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's going to do. You know, I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that worship is all about us. What we like, what our preferences are, what we prefer. And if we don't like it, then we make a fuss about it. Or we go leave and we go somewhere else. Well, I want you to hear this today. Worship is not about us. It's not about our favorite style of music or which service we happen to go to. Or about what kind of preaching we prefer. Or if we sing the songs that I know and that I want to hear. Worship is about Jesus Christ. Worship is centered on Jesus Christ. Worship revolves around Jesus and his work for us. I wonder what needs to change in our mindsets to make Jesus the very center of our worship. I think one thing we need to do is we need to resolve to make worship a priority in our lives. By making weekly worship a priority, that means that we are making Jesus a priority in our lives. And when we don't do that, when we don't make worship a priority, what kind of message do you think that sends to the rest of the world? Don't you think it sends a message to the rest of the world that, hey, we don't think Jesus is that important? We don't think Jesus really means that much to us. As long as there's something better going on over here, or something more exciting going on this weekend, I'm not going to be in worship. Hawkinsville first, is that really the message that we want to give to the world? How about we make worship a priority and we show others just how much Jesus means to us and how important he really is since he is the very center of it all. Something else I believe we can do is we can resolve to come to worship with a good attitude. Have you ever seen somebody come to worship with their arms crossed, their best frowns glued upon their faces because every single thing is not to their liking? Did you know that's not the official mascot of the church? Though it may seem that way sometimes. Did you know you can choose to not look like that? Did you know that we can choose to come to worship with a positive attitude and we can be excited to be here? We can come with expectant hearts about what God is going to do and what God is going to say through his word. Honestly, I feel like some people just come to church because they like to criticize things or they like to point out mistakes. They like to be mad about something. They like to judge. They want to tear something down. None of that has much to do with Jesus, does it? We can choose to pray before we come to worship each week. We can say, Jesus, I'm coming to worship you. I'm not going for myself. It's not about me. It's about you. Help me to give of myself to you this week. Help me to receive what you want to give. The congregation in heaven quickly realizes that it wasn't about them. Uh, They quickly see that none of them were worthy to open the scroll. None of them are worthy to bring about the purposes of God. It's only Jesus. And that means that we're not at the center. 
That means that we don't run the world. It is God in Christ Jesus. So I invite us all to remember this morning the good news that God has a future plan and a future purpose, a plan of renewal, a plan of healing, a plan of salvation, a plan to make the world brand new. And Jesus Christ is the very center of that plan. Through the cross, through the resurrection, we learn that Jesus is the true Lord of all the world. And the only fitting response to that is to worship him. And did you know this? Did you know that when we worship down here, that we're joining in the worship that's going on up there? Isn't that cool to think about? Worship is going on in heaven as we speak right now. Worship that is centered around Jesus Christ. The angels, the saints, everybody's there gathered around the throne worshiping their hearts out. We join in that every time we come to church. We join in that every time we gather together. It's not about us. It is about him. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Worthy to receive power Wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, and blessing. May Jesus be pleased with our worship this morning. May he see that we are a people, that we are a church that is centered on him. And that all of our worship and that all of our lives revolve around him and him alone. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Almighty God, we are so thankful for this, this picture of the, of the heavenly throne room and the lamb that was slain. We're thankful to look upon Jesus Christ, to remember all that he did for us, to remember the cross, to give thanks for his willingness to sacrifice himself for us and for our salvation. Lord, we want to be the people who are filled with new life that the Lamb wants to bring to us today. And then as we leave this place and go back out into the world, we want to share that new life with others because we want them to experience it as well. We want their lives to be changed. We want their sins to be forgiven. We want their hearts to be filled with life abundantly. Lord, thank you for calling us. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for giving us a mission to live as your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.